Today we're interviewing Dr. Taj Smith, Director of Diversity Education as part of the RIT Archives Story Booth Initiative. Taj recently chaired a new RIT event, Together RIT, a day of understanding, solidarity, and racial reconciliation on Friday, October 21st, 2022. Today is Friday, November 4th, 2022, and the time is 10.42 a.m. My name is Landon Hatch, and I am the Marie Golisano Graham Outreach Archivist in the RIT Archives. So, before we start questions, Taj, may I just ask for your verbal consent to record this interview? Yes, I consent. Great, thank you. And so, Taj, can you tell us how the idea for Together RIT was generated? Yeah, well, a lot of the motivation came through the Race and Ethnicity Action Plan um, that was sort of set in place um, it's probably about two years now. Um, and I was among many who were charged to participate in the subcommittee work from that plan. And so the subcommittee that I led had to do with uh, community leadership um, kind of content area. And um, I had had a sense of this kind of event being done on other campuses, um, previous campus that I worked on, as well as some other places. So it was sort of a personal idea that was then shared with the committee. Um, the committee had input on it um, and decided they, were, they liked the idea. Um, and we kind of brought in some other models. Um, so that was sort of the, the origin of how that idea came about. Um, you know, which originally was started off just as a day of understanding, solidarity, and racial reconciliation, and then eventually we uh, added it together RIT. And so you started at RIT in about 2019? Yes. Correct. So is this the, one of the first big events that you've put on on campus? Uh, yeah, I guess it would be the, the for a campus-wide event, yes. Okay. yes. And so... Let's talk about the planning process a little. So you mentioned there was a planning committee. How did you determine, you know, who you wanted to be representative of the campus on that? Right, right. Um, so some of those people came from the Race and Ethnicity, Ethnicity Action Plan subcommittee. But then we recognized we needed to have other, you know, perspectives um, involved. So we definitely wanted to make sure we had student representation, staff, and faculty representation. Um, so it really was uh, partly relying on other people to kind of make recommendations, um, also putting it out to the campus um, via our, it was like a volunteer option tab on the website, so people kind of signed up also that way. Um, but a lot of the folks had been involved in the process at some point with the plan, um, and so we compiled that group uh, together. And then out of that planning committee, the official Together RT planning committee, um, you know, we met for over a course of about a year, so really all of last year. Um, some people continued from fall to spring, and then a smaller group did some work over the summer. That was mostly your call for proposal folks, those who reviewed the actual proposals, and those who were still working on marketing. And so, how did the planning committee determine the three main conference themes? Mm -hmm. Understanding, solidarity, and racial reconciliation. Right, right. Yeah, that, that was big for me. Um, I was probably the driver, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> of that. Because I wanted to make sure that we as a committee understood what this day was about. Right, That this day was going to talk about race and ethnicity. But needed to do so in a complicated fashion of that. Uh, one, needing to include all racial, well, as many racial and ethnic groups as we can, or, that, or those that are relevant to our environment. Um, and so some of that led to teasing out the understanding, the solidarity, and reconciliation. And so we kind of uh, did kind of a brainstorming or mind mapping, if you will, activity. And we took each of those words and sort of said, well, what does it mean to understand something? And so we, you know, I was uh, the scribe, so I remember we were doing that on the whiteboard. And so we had a long list for all three of those sort of general terms. And it allowed for some alignment, but also disagreement, right? And we needed to go through that because I expressed to the group is that the people who were hoping to have attend this will look at each of these concepts or words differently. And we need to be able to accommodate that um, or be aware of that. And then later that would then go informing the proposals, right, which we knew and we wanted to make sure that it was 
expansive enough that people could submit what they were interested in. And so they also just needed to have those things defined so that helped them better write a, a more accurate proposal. And what was the, um, the sort of receipt, what was the proposal process like? Were, you know, faculty, was there any, like, pulling on your end? Was it, you know, was there a good campus response immediately? Or how did you guys work that out? Right. Yeah, I, I think because it was a, it's a new event and program, so there was a lot of educating uh, parts of the population on what the day was in general. Mm -hmm. By the time we got to the proposal release, um, kind of promoting it, you know, we were running up against the end of the semester, so it was like April okay. um, was really the time that most it would have gotten on some people's radars. The challenge is that, you know, looking back and what we would change for the next year is that we need to do that a little bit earlier, um, particularly for the student population who, you know, during April was a very busy month for them. Mm -hmm. uh, finals transitioning to real life, you know, quote-unquote real life after uh, being a, a student, um, you know, so there's a lot going on. So, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought now. Um, repeat your question again, sorry. Okay, so um, we're talking about the proposal process. Right, right. Um, so it was about April that it generally got on people's radar. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of, I'll ask a follow-up question, that's kind of a difficult time because I think people leave campus. Right. And so how did you continue to generate momentum over right. the summer and into October? Right. Yeah, so we knew we needed to review the proposals over the summer so that we can uh, use the accepted proposals uh, to help promote, to attend. And so that, that, that promotion needed to take place in August and September. Uh, for real kind of buy-in. So we got, uh, I would say probably our, our, the proposal due date was set for, I think, June 30th. Um, we probably had about close to 20 or so around that time, which I was happy with. Um, a lot of that happened in the last few weeks of June. <laughs> right. <laughs> so early on, there was like, you know, maybe a handful. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, what are we going to do here? Um, but we knew that some people would submit late. There were some folks we know, particularly students, um, some student leaders we did kind of send follow-up emails to and say, hey, we'll work with you um, if you submit, right, if, even if you need an extension past this June 30th deadline. So we were flexible, particularly with the student body, because we knew that, that April would be a difficult time. I did give some uh, extensions to some faculty and staff as well, but those were a smaller, you know, group of people. Um, because again, the, the committee wanted to review, and we did much of that review in July, but then we also wanted to, we needed to follow up with some folks, because their proposal uh, was missing some things. And so we wanted to follow up and say, hey, we need some additional information. So we needed that, you know, last two weeks or so of July to get their feedback to then really accept them by the middle of August. And so you mentioned targeting some specific student leaders. Mm -hmm. um, who were they or what organizations were they attached to? Yeah, we largely took the frame of demographics. And so making sure we wanted to have uh, some gender diversity, um, really amongst all of our uh, folks who submitted a proposal. Um, we wanted to have um, uh, hearing status kind of diversity, make sure we had folks who were deaf, um, hard of hearing, hearing participate, so that kind of led to some targeting. And then we saw um, from the student side around race and ethnicity that we weren't getting a lot of uh, student of color submissions early on. Um, we were getting white student submissions, which was great, we wanted that. Um, but not as much as students of color, so we targeted some uh, uh, of those. So, so LASA um, was a big Latino organization. Um, I think looking back on it, uh, we could have probably targeted some other groups as well. Um, but the demographic, the desire to have a diverse representation in not only topic, but also presenters, that really guided some of that additional outreach. And did you apply similar strategies to faculty and staff? Were there any colleges or departments that you targeted? 
Yeah, there was probably some because I knew that they were doing some work already in this area, so I might have given them a little extra nudge <laughs> or encouragement. Um, certainly, we didn't do that for all of the colleges, uh, for sure. Um, and that was probably just probably half oversight, half um, limited amount of time and, and follow-up, but also knowing that a lot of faculty don't engage over the summer. So very much like students, once summertime comes, they're try to remove on vacation or their writing and, and, and researching. So um, we knew that would be a stretch outside of personal connections we had. Okay. And so we're into August now mm -hmm. with the proposals. Um, running parallel to that is any of your efforts with planning. And I know you hired two students to work for you over the summer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So those two students were actually part of the, the whole process last year. They were on the on the marketing subcommittee, um, as well as a larger planning committee. And we had some other uh, students who did participate as well, but these students kind of stayed with it consistently. Um, and it was really due to advocacy of one of the uh, faculty members who was on the uh, subcommittee for marketing and, and whatnot, who advocated and said, hey, how about we leverage these two students who have some background in, in, in design, graphic design, um, as well as also pay them, uh, which I was, you know, supportive of once, once I let the idea sink in, sink in. So they had until actually to, I think it was July 1st, so much of June, they had to each produce, uh, I think I asked between two and four versions of a poster, and uh, each of them would submit, and then myself and a few other people kind of looked at them and, so, and sort of landed on the one that we use for mo much of our programming, or promotion rather. Um, so hopefully we will continue that process. I, you know, I really have the hopes to kind of promote them more widely instead of just focus on the two. It was just a first year kind of thing. It was convenient. But very but similar to Imagine RIT, where there's a whole kind of announcement and, hey, students submit your designs, and then there's a selection to the designs. We hope to get there at some point. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Because, you know, RIT, visual culture is so important here, and, you know, branding and cohesiveness and consistency. Um, as the sort of originator of the event, did you have a sort of visual in mind for what you wanted it? to look like in terms of the branding and marketing piece? Or did you let the students just... Yeah, that was a, it, was a tr it was a balance. Okay. Um, and I played the person in the middle trying to balance. So we do have marketing standards um, that come from our mar marketing and communications university office. And then our division of diversity inclusion has its own standards. Um, I was very clear that we need to abide by those standards, but also have some wiggle room to allow for these students to have greater flexibility in design, very similar to how we have for Imagine RIT, that doesn't fall into the traditional way of us marketing things on, on a regular basis. So I wanted to make sure we could mirror that process. Um, but I didn't have a particular image in mind. I, I really wanted it to be uh, student-informed in this case but also created in some way, and that's the best way that I can put it. Um, not just words on a, on a screen or on a poster, um, but something that would jump out to folks. Um, and that went into our decision making, and, and where we landed, this, the one that we chose was the brightest colors, right? It was closely tied to the general mission of, of, the, um, of the event. Um, so that definitely played into that decision. Okay. So we're into August. We have the student, Jay Riley, mm -hmm. correct, mm -hmm. who did uh, the fabulous poster design, and then the events in October. So what were you doing in that period once the semester ramped up? Yeah, most of that was um, doing last-minute checks with those who have uh, submitted a proposal and been accepted just to kind of say, hey, do you, we accept your proposal? Please let us know if you confirm this. So there's a little bit of that. Um, some of that involves a little more, a little bit of chasing down <laughs> some folks. Um, then really deciding on when is going to be the, the announcement for registration. Uh, so that would, that took up a lot of that time. And how we would do that. What would that look like? So I worked with some of our marketing professionals to kind of talk through that as an option. 
Um, and then we landed with really kind of laying out what the sessions would be and allow people to kind of make those choices, um, you know, about that. Um, outside of that, there was just the kind of additional uh, log- event planning logistics that you know most people don't pay as much attention to, but that we had to kind of really think of uh, what additional promotional things do we need to have? Uh, catering was is that all set up already? Are the rooms res- you know reserved and and have what they need? And so. Describe to us your day of experience. Right. You've done my, all this work. You've gotten to this great point. You know, what was it like? Well, my experience was busy and hectic, <laughs> to be honest. Um, it's hard for any or, organizer or event planner to ever really enjoy the event themselves because you're, you're managing all the logistics behind the scenes so that the participants can have a, a, a quality experience. Um, but that said, the parts that I was able to kind of be present for for a little bit of time, you know, I saw people who were engaged in whatever space that they were in, um, engaged in the topic, engaged in conversation, um, or whatever the activity might have been. So that definitely stood out. Um, I felt a level of um, excitement from others um, as well that. You don't often get to see on our campus. Uh, it happens, but it happens at smaller kind of events. But not all of us attend those events. So this the opportunity to have something campus-wide um, really brought that out for people, I think. Um, they were hungry for the, for the space. Whether they agree or disagree with the content is sort of separate, but they were definitely hungry or, or needed this kind of space as, as what... I observed, but also a lot of the feedback uh, that I did receive. Um, did you have any maybe favorite moments that you witnessed or participated in? Um, you know, I, I, one stands out uh, right now when I was in the, the sort of main our main space in, in Fireside Lounge, where we had a registration table, food, and some level of entertainment in the library present, uh, their project. I think watching some of the, there were some faculty there who were having a good time, right, and who were doing some of the dance instruction, and I hadn't seen them in that space before, right? I've only seen them in one-on-one conversation or or talking about their work, so to see them, I guess, let loose a little bit was was nice to sort of uh, see and observe that for for the five minutes I was in that space, um, you know. And I also think uh, that we have a lot of events on our campus, and and a lot of those happen to be in Engel Auditorium. And Engel Auditorium isn't the greatest design in terms of the layout, um, but I was pleasantly surprised by the attendance, particularly at the closing. Um, because we don't, in my experience, events I've attended that space where you don't even have that many people in there, and it's an auditorium that holds quite a you know few people. So those are two moments um, that I think really you know stand out for me. And then Taj, you kind of alluded to this um, just before, but you know how do you mitigate pushback for events like this? All right. Uh, one is to expect it. Um, with anything that is new, there's always going to be challenges or resistance to it. Um, so one to expect it, and, and I'm pretty good at that, um, <laughs> of, of, of doing that. I think uh, two is to make sure you're listening, actively listening. Um, because somebody might be presenting you with a perspective you haven't considered before. You need to be open to making that pivot or change um, in that moment, in that day, right? There's a lot of stuff you can do afterwards. Um, so, I, you know, those are the two things that sort of come, you know, come to my mind on that. And so, this is kind of a loaded question, but going into Together RIT and you've done all this planning and all this behind the scenes work, um, how did you define success for that event? 
Oh, that's a very good question. Um, me, I'm a realist, and so I like to keep my, my expectations <laughs> realistic. And so success in terms of numbers, uh, I had said all along if we get three, four hundred people, I'd be happy. And we were roughly around, you know, those those numbers in terms of participation. So that was one kind of check and marker of success. Then as I read through some of the um, submissions we received for the uh, sort of post-survey, um, reading through how people experienced the day um, gave me insight onto what might have been successful. And obviously also would need some improvement, but... Um, those are probably the, the two ways that I ga gauged it. And, and also following up with the volunteers. We had many volunteers, probably at least 20 plus volunteers. Um, and, and they are volunteers. Um, and, and getting a sense of how what their experiences were like and checking in with them and, um, and, and having them articulate what was successful about their space. So like I said, I couldn't be everywhere. I tried. Um, <laughs> I probably got to maybe 65% of the programming, but uh, definitely didn't get to some other ones. And is there any volunteer or presenter feedback from the event that stands out to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think on the, on the positive side of it, um, that hunger that I mentioned earlier, a lot of people mention that in, in different ways of phrasing that, but... Uh, and, and, and wanting to see this happen again, you know, because you can have an event like this and this, a campus-wide event, you know, sometimes those things are hit or miss. Um, <laughs> uh, but to have people say, for the most part, we want to see this again with a few tweaks um, was one of the big positive ones. You know, I think from a critical standpoint, which I largely would agree with, um, one of the dominant forms of feedback were um, just some of the improving the communication around uh, registration and uh, room location for the day. And we had anticipated some of that would, would happen. Uh, we were limited by some systems uh, that we were using. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something to kind of pay attention to so that the user experience can be better for next time. And then... What are your long-term goals for this event? Yeah, well, I think to uh, continue it, I don't have a, a number of years to say, like, well, it's going to be 20 years, or it's going to be a staple program for 50-plus, I don't know. So um, I'm not thinking that far, far out, um, but definitely to see it return next year, to see... Um, it become a little uh, a full day rather than a kind of half day experience, which was a lot of the feedback we did receive as well. Um, so we're working on that. There's some calendar challenges with that. Um, and and uh, two other things, definitely to see more s s student engagement uh, because a lot of we didn't have that much feedback from students, um, but the feedback that we get is the sense that they didn't, instead the students didn't feel like this was open to them. They felt that it was just open to faculty and staff. Um, despite our many efforts <laughs> to try to, to, to address that, that's what was their feeling, and so we need to think about that and honor that. I also think in, in better, doing a better job engaging some of our um, some hourly staff that we have because I didn't see their presence and I know I know that you know campus wasn't shut down so people have to work to, to still keep the place up people have to work to support the event um, but I would like to see greater uh, participation um, from those especially work in facilities um, so that's a long-term goal for me to kind of work on and figure out how we can increase that presence and population um, you know, for the day. All right, Taj. So in true story booth fashion, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to respond to one or more of our Together RIT prompts. Mm -hmm. um, and at this time, you know, please just be sure to read out the prompt before responding.
So there's a point you want me to connect these questions to the day of, of, of the event? Yeah, or just okay. your experience, okay. your perspective. Um, I you know, I think... I'll start with the first one. Why was it important for you to participate in this event? Um, obviously, besides <laughs> the, the clear reasons that I was designated as the kind of lead organizer of the event, but also recognizing... Um, Everybody has some kind of influence on other people. Um, I know I have some influence on some people on campus, and so me showing up um, is important for that population, right? Me also, during the process of creating this event, um, as a black African-American man, making sure that I am saying, hey, we need to not only learn about our identities as black people, but also the racial and ethnic identities of other people. And so making sure to advocate that there was space for that in the programming um, and to also encourage people to step outside their comfort zone, whatever that is. Um, so to attend sessions that you just don't know every, you know, that you know or things about already. So I think that that's you know, what I would say for this first question. Um, you know, I guess tying into the second one, since I'm on that topic, which is as a person of color attending a predominantly white institution, what has your experience been as a student or employee at RIT? So I've been here my fourth year. My experience, um, like other people's experience, is group informed, but also individual informed. Um, I will say for me, it's been largely a positive experience. Now, what goes into that? And that goes into that is that I work in the Division of Diversity and Inclusion. So generally, right, we as uh, employees in this space value that, you know, space value that kind of conversation. I know that my peers who do not work in a space like that have a more difficult time having those conversations, right, because that's not what the content of their environment is, right? Um, so recognizing my environment makes it very easy to, to be who I want to be and have the conversations that I want to have. Um, also my title as a director, right, comes with a level of power and status, um, that makes my experience different than other people who may share a common racial or gender identity. So because of all of that, like, my experience has been, you know, largely great, wonderful, um, not a big, no really major hurdles for me personally. Um, I also think that because I'm, well I've been here four years, I'm still relatively an, an outsider, right? I didn't grow up in Rochester, um, I, you know, came from other institutions before I worked here and so I bring that not necessarily global, but kind of regional, geographical diver, diver experience to the topic of race and racism within a college. And I've seen the extreme examples. I've seen places that do it really well. Um, and so I bring all that with me to my experience. Um, and so that allows me to kind of see the things that RIT is doing really well versus some of my peers who might have been here for a longer time and don't have something else to compare it to. Um, and then I could also see where there's challenges, but i also seen that challenge at my last two jobs. So it's not RIT, it's a larger higher education issue, right? So all of that said, that kind of, that, that explains why I have this unique experience of it largely being a positive uh, you know, peace uh, also as, as the intersection as being a man as well plays a role, right? Uh, that's things that I don't have to face that a woman of any racial background has to face, but also a woman of color faces a, a particular kind of mixture of racism and sexism um, on, that, on this campus, which I do think sometimes is greater um, than those of us who are men of color, but positionality also influences that. Um, if 
focus on the last one. Uh, how, in your experience, does RIT talk about race? What, cha what changes would you like to see implemented regarding campus conversations? So I, I think there's a lot of individuals and small groups who want to and do have conversations about racial diversity in healthy and celebratory ways, and then want to or have conversations about racism, the sort of negative side of that conversation. The challenge is how do we do that as an entire campus, across disciplines, across departments, across divisions. That we don't do, you know, to my, based on my experience. So I would like to see more of that, and I think others would like to see more of that because I think some folks on campus don't feel like they can have these conversations in their units, but would very much uh, like to have them <laughs> with others outside of their unit. And how does one go about doing that? And so I find folks um, either feel constrained by the structures around them or personally constrained themselves to step outside of their space to have these conversations with others. So what happens is that programming that I end up developing helps fill that gap. It gives them a mechanism to have the conversation um, and hopefully the skills and a comfort level and confidence to come with that. So I do think we can do more of that intentional um, conversation as well as you know other people who bring up actions. I do think talking is an action. It can't be the only action that one engages in, but it is an action and an important one because we actually don't do it across differences as much as we think we do. Um, and so, um, you know, I think I think that's important. And there's a lot of actions being done, but I think when you're when when you're in an environment where silos are a real thing, you look at the RIT from your lens and your silo. And your silo might not be doing anything, right? We're not doing as much as you want. But for me, I'm privileged in, in my position that I get to see the, the, not the whole picture, but I get to kind of see more. Um, and so I could see who's doing what and who's not doing what more easily than others. And so I feel more encouraged by that because I have access to people who really want to do the work and who are doing the work versus folks who don't have that experience. So, I'll end there. Okay. Um, so, we're almost done. Mm -hmm. One question that I did want to ask you related to the story booth mm -hmm. is that um, students are responding very well to our identity-based questions. Okay. Um, you know, students are, the question that you answered, you know, as a person of color attending a predominantly white institution, students are liking that. Um, they're liking having some sort of platform to share their experience and then being represented within the collections. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you, you know, how can the archives engage in these conversations that you're articulating? You know, because we have the collection, we have these responses, we're going to put them on a web platform so they can be represented that way, but what else can we be doing, in your opinion? Well, I will say one, that's, that's, what you're doing is, is, is important and a big step because uh, for as far as I know, and I haven't gone into all the archives, uh, but I know there's gaps in our history, right? And so that's important to, to capture. And RIT, again, is not alone in not tracking some of that history. Outside of that, you know, are there interactive ways that people can engage with what you're uploading? Whether that be on the website itself, social media, um, you know, do you put some of these recordings out there into the world? People respond on, on Instagram or something. So I think that could be one, one way. You know, I think what we've, you know, we've started to enter into this kind of, um, collaboration partnership for the Heritage Months, I think would be very, uh, useful to really, uh, to everybody, but also for you all as archive slash library, right, to be more visible, be more accessible, uh, rather than how traditional ways we've thought about the library, right, um, versus people come to you, versus you going to them. So I do think that will, will 
prove to be useful as, as we kind of build that into the culture. Um, you know, I think, I forget, I think it was a couple years ago before the pandemic really hit, and I forget who had this charge, but the library was doing holding like conversations um, around diversity broadly. And so that can be one way where you all are facilitating the conversation, creating the, the content, so just not archiving the content, but also creating some of it. Um, the last thing that I can think of is, is, is uh, making sure to enhance our collections, you know. Um, and I don't know how often students use library, <laughs> libraries anymore in terms of the, their collections. Um, because I, mean, I don't have that experience anymore. But um, when I access it, I know we have gaps right in our database. When I'm trying to find a film or something, I'm like, why don't we have this? This is like a staple thing. Why don't we have this in our collection? Now, I know we kind of use some films on demand and all the places that might have it, and I think those are good, but I also don't think a lot of people know about those tools. Um, so... Um, I think those are other ways in terms of increasing the collection um, and showcasing that collection over time would also be, you know, very useful. All right, Taj, and is there anything else that we didn't discuss today that maybe you wanted to cover? I think the last thing I'll add for Together IT is um, just making sure, you know, I want to get the message out that this uh, event isn't just going to focus on race and ethnicity moving forward. I think because of where it started from and or birthed out of that is, and, and who's driving it now, uh, that is some people's understanding. And we may do it again next year in terms of that, that topic. Um, but we'll hope, I'm hopeful that we will also look at other kinds of diversity, um, celebratory ways and in critical ways. Um, because I think that's just the reality of our community, <laughs> um, but also it engages the people differently, right? And we don't make this one topic stale, because after a while we'll become stale in terms of the format and having conversation about it. So that's one thing I definitely want to add um, to the, to the to the conversation. But other than that, um, I'm all set. So I appreciate it. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you.